Consulting. You are watching Evernet Roundtable, a show where we are uh, inviting guests to just basically sit around a table and talk about a subject matter or theme that we find interesting. It's unscripted and uh, it's recorded live. So uh, we just uh, are going to see how this goes. Uh, it's a new uh, new show style. So hopefully you guys get a kick out of it and find something useful. Today, we are going to talk about cybersecurity or the state of cybersecurity in business. And today, I am joined by Wes Spencer of Fifth Wall. Let me just bring us up here and let me just kill that overlay. And we have Wes Spencer from Fifth Wall Solutions. Uh, they are a uh, cyber, cyber insurance uh, expert and prov um, uh, provider. Maybe we'll learn a little bit about them today. And uh, with us, we also have Connor Swam, the CEO of Fin Security, a security awareness training platform. How's it going, guys? It's going doing well. great. How's it, how was that for an intro? <laughs> it was good. We got through it. it. I love we got, it. <laughs> we got through it. Unscripted, recorded live. So. Um, yeah, so I appreciate you guys joining me today on Evernet Roundtable. Um, like I said, we're just going to talk about uh, cyber, the state of cybersecurity in business and um, see if we can offer something to it. Uh, before we get started, why don't you guys, let's start with Wes again. Wes, tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about um, who you represent today. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm a cybersecurity nerd, have been pretty much all of my professional career. And um, in 20. Let's see, you're really making me think here. 2016, we started a company called Perch Security. Um, Perch was a managed cybersecurity company um, helping organizations around like threat detection and response, all of that. And we sold that in 2020 to ConnectWise. And so I stayed on there for about a year. It was ConnectWise's VP and external chief security officer. Um, so really working with clients all over the world on cybersecurity, how to message it, how to make things better, how to work through the challenges there. And then recently I've, I've stepped on board as a vice president at Fifth Wall Solutions. And so Fifth Wall is the, I think the largest cyber insurance broker that's out there. So we have access to 40 plus carriers um, and we're just helping organizations of all size go through that cybersecurity insurance journey and challenge, which has just become fever pitch for sure. So that's a little right. bit about me. Yeah, you're in the right place at the right time, I think, for sure. Um, not to derail, Connor, we'll get to you for a second, but you know my style. I want to dig. I, I can't help but dig right away. Uh, Wes, are, is Fifth Wall a platform for companies like mine, the ITSP, the IT service provider slash MSP managed service provider to um, get in between the insured and the insurer? Or are you are because um, I was looking at your website and I couldn't tell that you it looks like you have a partner model for the MSP like us. But I also I couldn't tell if you where how does that relationship work? Yeah, for sure. So we do have a channel program uh, and it, it's awesome. I'm helping build it right now. Um, but there's a since we're talking insurance and since insurance is regulated, there's a bunch of nuances that exist on like things you as an MSP can and can't say legally speaking. And so that's a big piece of what our partner program is, is all about is education, kind of teaching you as an MSP, like how to engage in the conversation with clients while also not assuming liability by saying things that, um, you know, MSPs can't say like, this is the policy for you, or you right. need these limits. And so, yeah, we definitely kind of are lining you up to be that, that, um, broker of the conversation, right. And how to engage in it, but, but certainly there's limits too. So that's Eric, you, you pretty much nailed it. That's exactly what we're, we're doing. Okay. Then, but we so. are effectively would be, uh, uh, bringing you the, um, the, uh, the prospect, so to speak. And then you would, you would be engaging them directly as the broker. Yeah, exactly. And, and we can talk about this more later in depth if you want, but that's exactly where it all came from, right? Because now all of these questionnaires have gotten so complex that clients are like, I don't know what to do with this. MSP, you do this, figure it out for me. And then they right. get stuck in the middle. So that's really sure. where all this, the genesis moment came from. Yeah, I'm knee deep in that for sure. Um, okay, thanks, Wes, for that. Connor, uh, you have been a, a repeat guest on our Evernet Reviews uh, show, which I appreciate and we enjoy each other a lot. Tell us, um, for the for the audience who have, who haven't seen you yet, tell us who you are and uh, where do you where from you hail? Sure, uh, <clears throat> I hail from Delaware. Probably the first person. <laughs> People listening to this, wherever they're, they're listening to this, uh, not only incorporated, but I actually live and work out of Delaware. I'm looking at it right now. 
Are you like uh, on the University of Delaware, like campus? I'm right. I'm actually right next to it. Uh, yeah, I, I live it. in a neighborhood just north of the campus. Newark, uh, right? Yeah, Newark. That's very cool. So uh, I actually could I could walk to it if I wanted to. But I had I had uh, as an aside, I had a, I had a friend that went to Udell, and we would uh, go down. I'm from the Hartford, Connecticut area, so it's only yeah. four hour drive down, and we would. And we would enjoy the University of Delaware campus uh, quite a bit. And there used to be a restaurant called Grotto's. Yeah, that was like a, a sports bar, just mania. Um, so It is definitely a dive bar. Your feet stick to the floor when you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So tell us, tell us about Finn Security. Tell us about you. Where, um, you know, what's your background and, and what are you doing with Finn? What is Finn? Sure. So uh, I am the... CEO and co-founder of Finn Security. We are a security awareness training platform for MSPs. So uh, my background is I studied math in college, started a software development company that, you know, through a few iterations ended up being what Finn is today. Uh, and what we noticed was uh, a huge gap in the current security awareness market where managed service providers, IT service providers like yourself just didn't have the time didn't have the features they needed that solved the pain points that y'all had that are a little different from enterprises when launching and running really complex security awareness programs. So I decided to fix it. And here we are like three years. So ago. you launched Finn Security, which is, a, uh, can we call it a software product? It's not a service. It's a software it's, product. It's SaaS, yeah. It's software, software as a service. Yeah. So, and you are, um, you're not direct con to consumer, you're channel only? channel only yep okay so the so for um you know I don't, again it's hard to say whether we'll have a lot of non you know we a lot of the msp community i think um do watch our videos um but for uh, our you know my potential clients out there the dis business decision makers um you know we resell uh software as a security awareness training platform and manage it on behalf of our clients so that's the the paradigm with Finn security. Yeah. So we would engage as a partner with, uh, with Finn, um, and then make that available to our market. Um, whereas fifth wall, conversely, their <clears throat> partnership, um, but the relationship would be by and between the insurer or the end end consumer with fifth wall. So that's important to, to state that. And what's kind of interesting about having you guys as a guest is I'm kind of the bridge between both, both of you in, uh, in a lot of that context. Um, and for those uh, who don't know who I am, uh, I am Eric Bjorndorf, the CEO of Evernet Consulting. We're an IT service provider for businesses all over the country. Um, we're also a managed service provider. So when I started this company uh, almost 20 years ago, we used to be called an ITSP or an IT service provider. And then the uh, the managed the managed model has come up in the last in that time. And that just implies some fixed fee per month uh, per per unit price. So um, that's who we are. That's the panel for today. So um, really excited to have you guys on today. We're, yeah. um, you know, obviously, you know, the realm that w the three of us cover uh, overlap in is the cybersecurity space. So what's going on in cybersecurity? Who wants to? Who wants to jump off uh, and, and set us off here? And and specifically cybersecurity, um, well, shit, we could talk about it. We could take it in any direction, but you know, let's. The viewers of this show are going to be business decision makers, right? So, what's what are what are businesses facing today in the cybersecurity space from uh, regulation, expectations, and business operations, and anything in between? What do you say, Wes? Yeah, I, this is something I'm really passionate about, Eric, is um, working with decision makers. I spent the majority of my career, you know, using even as a CIO at a bank before we started Perch, you know, working with non-technical decision makers. And ultimately, they are one of the most important um, uh, representatives inside of the company when it comes to like buy-in and all of this. And I think when you think about what's happened in the cyber um, world uh, over the past, you know, 2018 to today, we've seen threats come down market like crazy, like never before, right? We see threat actors on the, on like really coming after small and mid-sized business. And I think if you're in the era of 2017 and before, Eric, it's totally fine for a small business to say, or even a mid-sized business, like I'm not a target. No one's coming after me. You know, they're going <laughs> after Target. They're going after Bank of America, not me. And today that is totally flipped. You know, now they're going specifically after you. I mean, just ask yourself this philosophically, if I'm a bank robber, 
am I going to go try to rob like downtown Bank of America in New York City or whatever? You know, it's probably got armed guards everywhere, armed to the teeth. Or am I going to go after a small rural bank? I mean, let I'm me jump. Let me jump in on this. Yeah, please. La last week, my business manager sent me an email that she got from uh, some very, I, I wish I could remember what the organization was, some very official looking organization. And maybe even it looked like the DOL, Department of Labor or something that that asked her to click a link to follow, to submit unemployment uh, accounting information for one of our employees. Oh, wow. So she was addressed by name giving a very relevant looking context email about another employee in our organization. Yeah. That's not, that was not a automated, that was not a no. bot or a script that was automated across millions. That was literally that, that, I mean, tell me, right. That has to have been a, what they call a spearfish, right? Yep. Very Where targeted. They, they researched our company. They found who was the, you know, the, the uh, an administrator or manager role. In the context of payroll and HR, so they even yeah. got to the right person and so tried to appeal to her to click a link, which is always the that's always the the call to action, right? Click the link, and referenced another employee in our organization. She, you know, fortunately, we dog food our own product, and I, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the track here, but hopefully this is relevant. We dog food our own products that we recommend and sell to our clients, namely cyber secu or security awareness training. So I don't even want to say her name, but of course she's findable. Susie in our business, in our business admin does take cyber, uh, security awareness training, you know? So she, yeah. and she's not, she's a non-technical resource. So through that training, I believe that she has been strengthened through that training platform. So she forwarded that to, to me, for, to a resource to validate, right? It's always I validate, 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 right? And when I saw that, I was, I was aghast at how quality that, that uh, fish looked. So I don't mean to be like emphatical here, but it's, 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 we're at that level. Yeah. Right. It's, go ahead. It's way more than just, uh, you know, misspelled Starbucks gift card, Amazon right. scams, which everyone thinks, oh, that's, that's fishing, right? And while well, there's those, a lot of that, those phishing attempts, we all know, I mean, through, I mean, I, I read way too many news articles and, and outlying, uh, you know, articles or whatever, but we, we know that you can, you can you be a 12 year old boy in an app in a developing nation with a laptop in a, in an internet cafe and, 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 uh, and target Americans to, and siphon tens of thousands of dollars out of, out of people just through, through those means. Right. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever, you guys know who Mark Ro Rober is. Oh Rober? yeah. My kids watch him constantly. I love yeah. Mark Rober. Have you, did you see what he did with targeting the hackers? Did you see yep. one of his latest videos? Great. Video. I mean, you know, he like, so like we know, you know, the, who, the, who, the, uh, who, who a lot of the attackers can be. So when, yeah, when you see the identifying email, as you were saying, Connor, that like the misspelling, or the, or the, you know, the, the bad phrased email, like that's the easy stuff to spot. But this email yeah. that Susie <clears> got <throat> was, it looked, I mean, it was, there was not a spelling error in it. It yeah. looked quite, it, it looked actionable, you know, like it looked administrative, like a governmental actionable, you know? So what I, what I tell everyone now is that like phishing emails come in a spectrum of like difficulties, like on the far end is misspellings sent from random hexadecimal character at gmail.com. It's like, okay, if you get fished by that, we really need to have a conversation. But right. this one you mentioned, it sounds like the only thing that was missing was they purchased a typo squatted domain or had access to a compromised email account right. of yourself or one of your third parties. And if that were the case, almost indetectable. At that point, there needs to be a gut reaction from every single one of your employees. It's like the light bulb goes off because that is valid traffic from a valid sender to a valid receiver with valid information in it. And it's like, there's nothing to other than the human sitting at the end to recognize that something weird's going on. I'm convinced, uh, I'm convinced that that was, that was why I'm, I'm spending so much time on it with you guys, because it was the best phishing email that I've ever seen. And I'd I, like to it, so far as it, <laughs> say again, 
<laughs> I'd like to see it if you can send it over. I, I don't want to derail us too much, but I can try right to now, find, right find it. Um, but um, it was when it when a phishing email gives me pause when I when I have to read it several times. You know, uh, it was one of those, and I've been doing this a long time. And and so, this is why Eric, like, we're in this era today. We're 2022, and here we are. Phishing is still the number one threat vector. And business email compromise, which is like the threat that comes out of that, which is like wire fraud, ACH fraud, all that stuff, is still the number one threat. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, we talk about ransomware all the time, which is significant, but you nailed it. Like that is it. And it's because tools don't really stop this stuff. Knowledge stops this stuff. And, well, because uh, it's an intellectual agree. attack. Yep. Right. It's not a bit and bite attack. Right. It's it's an intellectual attack. And to Connor's point, for example, like the the I'm I'm convinced that the way that we survived that attack is because of the in, the behavioral uh, prep preparedness that that Susie was receiving through the security awareness training, for example. Like and 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 I'm embarrassed to say that uh, three years ago uh, and and beyond, we were not providing i was not providing that to my own resources you know and as a and and in, in the way that we are providing cyber uh are you guys where are you guys on cybersecurity training or security awareness training is it or is it safe to say that they're one and the same i i know what you mean when you say but i consider them the same thing yeah okay yeah. me me too okay so security awareness training we used to provide security awareness training as a labor or consultative based service yeah. So we and, you know, with with the nature of a lot of our work and our maintenance services and things, um, we can't we can't unilaterally apply them and give them to our clients. We have to solicit them and say, hey, it's time to do a, a data center maintenance or a server maintenance or, you know, it's time for us to go through. And, you know, yes, we can monitor all these things. We've been monitoring health and security of our systems for years, but still. It, you still have to do the manual test restore. You still have to do, uh, you know, the manual check for updates, making sure that the up, the uh, the automatic, you know, the updaters actually work. I don't know if you guys are very technical, but I remember days where like uh, automatic Windows automatic updates was enabled. And then you go to the automatic updates tab in Windows and say check for updates. And then all of a sudden, like it gives you a battery of updates that haven't been installed, <laughs> you, you know, Um so the maintenance routine. So with the security awareness training, we were sending email campaigns to our clients saying time to get your you know time for training. And then the way that we were providing it was a um, well years ago, certainly pre COVID, I would go I would go in personally with some quasi professional cur curriculum that I've that I've built um, and then tried to deliver that in a conference room full of employees who who showed up. Yeah. never the decision maker, rarely the receptionist, <laughs> you know what I mean? So the like it was, a, it was, it was, it was horrible, right, Connor? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I recognize that there can be some value in in-person security awareness training. Well, but more training is always better than less. To some extent, because you can start, I have worked with companies, the uh, MSPs, uh, where in some of their clients, like I go talk to the client, they're like, I've been doing this every week for years. It's like, I can't spend 30 minutes a week on my cybersecurity where I've already seen all this. I already get all this. And so they mentally start to check out. Oh. And um, my goal is to create, you know, the habit that Susie, maybe that's her real name, maybe you know, Su you're right. canonical Susie, canonical uh, Joe. Or Su something. Susie office worker is the, yeah, is Susie the office identity. Worker. We. <laughs> um, my goal is that Susie has a habit. And when that email comes across her desk or her, is, maybe it's a text message or maybe it's a voicemail, that there's a habit that was generated that the light bulb pops off just like it happened. So props to I'm, Susie office worker. I'm going to show you, I'm going to do a screen share. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah, sure. let's do it. I don't want to show you my whole, let me just minimize. I would love to show you this in full context, but it, I'm going to do a full screen here. Wes, I feel like I cut you short too. So we're going to, we're going to get oh, you're back. Fine. You're totally fine. This has been a, this is a rabbit trail. It's not really a rabbit trail. So it is actually Susie. And now you guys know all the hackers out there definitely know who, who she is, but this is what's, this is what's amazing. 
that's what what it was and and this is probably a, a horrible thing to admit too but it actually they actually referenced the company we use paychecks for our payroll wow okay so Susie forwards this to me look at um is this legit here's the email a francione at employersedge.com in order for our team to process the requested information efficiently and timely, please do not change the subject line in this email. We have received an unemployment claim on, on behalf of your company. Please click the link below and complete the secure online questionnaire to submit relevant separation information available. Pertaining to claimant Ian Pru. Ian is our one of our account managers. Okay. So if you go to employersedge.com, that's an actual website with uh, actual, it, it looks 100% legit. And I think that's what was even trickier about this. It's they're spoofing, yeah. the, they're spoofing the dome email domain. They're representing the company Employers Edge, which you're, what you're saying is valid, right? It's but all that doesn't website. matter because the act this the the action item they're trying to get Susie to do is click on on the questionnaire, right? Paychecks-ui.com. That's a paychecks-ui.com. That's not real. Not real. In fact, if we we did a little digging, we probably I wonder what the revert what the uh the DNS regist registration is for that domain. It's probably masked or proxy. What do you think, Wes? Yeah, that's um, that's pretty interesting. It would be interesting to throw that through like a URL analyzer. <clears throat> I used to do that a lot in my banking days because, you know, it's important to know where links are coming in and from. But that it this is very, 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 very legitimate. I'd say this is a ten out of ten in terms of um, you know targeting and and being specific. Wow, that's wild, I, isn't it? I'd venture to guess nine out of ten people wouldn't even give it a second thought. I mean, they referenced our payroll company. They, they went to the right resource in the company. You know, Susie does our payroll and they referenced one of our employees. I mean, it, it was, and then the, what the page looked good. So it's like, you know, it was, I was like, wow, that is that. And then of course we had a little, you know, conversation about phishing and stuff. And I said, this is why we dog food these, you know, we use these tools, you know, we Absolutely. do, we, we practice what we preach for lack of better, better example. And, you know, I'm thinking like, what's the outcome of an attack like that? <clears throat> you know, let's say that that she hadn't notified anyone. She thought it was legit. She'd fed her credentials in. Any number of things could happen from that. Some really scary things. You think about the power HR has in terms of payroll, in terms of like all of these kinds of things. You've seen payroll fraud before where an employee is set up and, you know, they're being paid and something like that is not noticed and reconciled for quite some time, you know, so that, that's not just a, you know, a phishing attack that like could have been kind of scary because someone's credentials could have been leaked. Like you're talking about serious dollars that were at stake here. Um, so, wow. You know, I think the the outcome and the damages are what people don't often think about where the real risk may lie. Yeah, I mean, you could have you're right. The the manifestation of an act, a successful attack could have been, um, uh, you know, could have been a small amount of funds siphoned off, siphoned off to a side account for forever or for, you know, the next year or several years or whatever, or could it, they could yeah. have come in with a sledgehammer and just as soon as they had access to the accounts and a routing number, you know, we do direct deposit, for example. So, you know, now, you know, now they're accessing maybe our general operating account, but now accessing the the checking accounts of all of the employees, not to mention so security number information, you know, so security information for for all the employees. Um, I mean, yeah, it, that's that's big. And you know, another another um, another thing that we're coming to find out, and it's not really clever once you once you have that aha moment. But our company manages thousands of computers and hundreds of businesses so we are becoming the it company is uh, the the uh, is now becoming uh, a significant attack vector or attack attack vector for uh, for other companies i guess if you will um and we saw that with the solar winds hack right yeah, we saw it there. Um, we saw it with the Kaseya attack. We saw it with the ConnectWise Kaseya attack way back in 2018, multiple times where 
threat actors very specifically know the value of an MSP and they know that you hold keys to the kingdom. It's sort of like the same analogy of like, if you're the facilities management person for a big condo, you've got the keys to all the doors. And so right. uh, it's a pretty- Or a janitor a, at a bank, right? Yep. I mean, do you, do, you, do you just brute force your way through the front door or do you try to exploit you know, the janitor? Yep. So these supply chain attacks have become significant. And bad guys know this, and they they certainly are going after targets of opportunity. They are not just spraying and praying here. Um, they're very specifically going after um, where big payouts occur. And you consider, you know, SMB space not as well protected. You look at, um, you know, keys to the kingdom with MSPs and, and getting volume at 40 to 60 clients in one fell swoop. Uh, that, that, that gets any threat actor just salivating at the mouth. And Connor, I mean, you know how many of these come through email and come through attacking the human, not trying to bypass defenses, right? A lot of them come this way, right? Most, uh, and I've, I have a few theories as to why, but I think the probably the most uh, prevalent is uh, as networks, as companies become more secure, uh, <clears throat> the human behind um, behind all of that typically becomes the more vulnerable piece, not necessarily because humans are more vulnerable than they were 10 years ago, but in relation to how secure businesses are today, uh, they might well, be. I mean, I could speak to that. I mean, so we're, we, um, for a lot of years, we were, the way we grew our company was just provide a great product, great service at a great value, be, be respondable, um, be available. Uh, sure. We did some chamber of a cha chamber, local chamber of commerce, uh, wine and dines and at business after hours, um, things like that. And we did some acquisitions and things. So that's how we grew. Um, but let's face it, the ROI on that kind of marketing and, and sales strategy is not as good as just sending 20,000, uh, marketing emails per month. Yeah. It, it, so mar <coughs> digital, digital marketing, uh, through, you know, uh, digital marketing encompasses what uh, your, your, your web, your web space, websites, um, social, uh, e and email. And let's face it, our audience, our target, target out the, the, you know, the business uh, realm operates in front of a screen all day, every day. So when we're building, you know, we're starting to build a, um, a really cool marketing team to help, uh, you know, grow, grow our business. And we're not even considering right now, um, chamber, of, chamber of commerce events and, 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 um, that sort of things, because the, when we, when you compare that, we can just, we can just buy more lists and send more emails. So the hackers are obviously, you know, back back before email was the primary business tool, they were sending chain letters in the mail, right? They were they were they were doing the phone call scamming, and and even, you know, I don't know if you guys ever seen the hackers movie. You ever see hackers? Yeah, the, the wonderful yeah. movie uh, with Matthew Lillard and and Angelina Jolie and all them. Um, you know, remember when they were hacking? That involved acting like you were a flower delivery guy or a telephone worker. And, you know, all he had to do was, you know, remember Matthew Lillard was like, he had like the tool belt on and the hard hat and he like uh, convinced the receptionist that he was there to fix the phones and he like bugged her phone, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but now when you can just send thousands and thousands and thousands, and certainly to a spammer scammer, um, they don't even care about the uh, quality of the, of you know, there are a lot of uh, honeypots and tools on the internet that will try to um, detect when a mass spammer is sending. Right. Um, unfortunately, it's like one of those, it's one of those systems where like legitimate emailers, if they start spamming, they will get harmed, <laughs> but the scammers don't care because they don't care about the, the health of the domains that they send from. Yep. Does that make They'll sense? Just spin up a new one right There's after they get shut down. Or they're yep. just spoofing, right? Because that that one we we that that example we saw that was probably a spoofed email. Any any undeliverable or bounce or uh, damage that it did to that domain, that scammer didn't care. He he only wanted the send the recipient to click on a link in the email and job yeah. done. Well, so we send a lot of emails, so I can actually tell you what does and does not hurt our domain. Uh, flat out reject hurts, but a bounce or undeliverable or something wrong with the receiving address doesn't doesn't hurt it uh in terms of you won't get blacklisted you won't get put on any kind of uh, uh company's list that's going to make sure you can't go email other people but a flat out reject you will so as soon as you just see the rejects start coming through just switch domains and right. you have a brand new domain 
ready to go. And actually, we ran across something like this. Uh, it's really interesting, Wes. I don't know if I've ever told you this. We put up a, a year and a half ago, we put up a contact form and something went wrong with our CAPTCHA. It just wasn't working. You didn't even need to fill it out in order to submit a contact form. <clears throat> and we didn't catch it till about three months later when uh, a whole bunch of not no exaggeration uh, um russian email addresses because it had the dot ru ending started spamming us spamming that contact form hundreds of times a minute so it happened overnight we had like forty thousand emails attempted to get delivered and they had already set up the mail rules at that mail server to reject all of our traffic so i woke up to forty thousand rejected emails um our transactional email provider called me was like what the hell is going on but they're like you we've shut down your account it's like you are clearly a bad actor we don't know what's happening we see russia's involved uh you're destroying our internal ips sending capability and i was like what the hell is going and so i just called them up i was like no 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 no. i was like look at our website look at our domain I was like, this is not us this is what happened and then they looked at our website and they're like okay fix your captcha and we'll reinstate you but that was wow. like a week of like we had no we were like what what is going on it was insane. that's wild yeah so let's let's touch on the insurance bit a little bit i think i think we we skipped over that a little bit wes what um a, a business owner an office manager an executive assistant what what's what's their experience like i mean i could speak for this but i, I don't want to do all the talking what what are what are they going through what's important to them um what are their fears what are you seeing you know, I think at a high level, when we're talking about this, we're talking about risk, right? We're talking about business risk. And if there's one thing, I've been a business owner, um, even am a business owner. One of the things that keeps you up at night as a business owner are like, what are those existential threats that can take down my business? And we think about this all the time. That's why we insure against fire. It's why we insure against hazard and life and health and all these kinds of things, right? And so that makes sense because we say there are certain things that could really cause systemic damage to my business that I want to risk transfer out to insurance, right? So when that impending event happens, I have the opportunity to make a claim and get some outside help. And I think once you understand, like we've been talking about how prevalent cybersecurity is at a risk level, all of a sudden we, we begin to understand, whoa, maybe this is something I should do something about from an insurance perspective as well. And here's the challenge, Eric. The challenge is in the old days to get cyber insurance, all you had to do is like have a name, have a business name and fog a mirror and like you got insurance. It was super fog easy, mirror. you know? Right. Yeah. And then here's what happened. All of these small and mid-sized businesses start getting hit by ransomware or business email compromise and ransomware in particular, you know, while the average SMB um, we see with the app, it's much less than what you see on studies. It's about $250,000 for the average ransomware payment. But you compound outages, you compound data, like monitoring kind of stuff, recovery, all these things, it hits a million dollars every time. And so all of a sudden, these insurance companies are like, wait a second, we're, we're a for-profit company. We're not in the business of giving out millions of dollars over and over and over and over. We're supposed to be an insurance company and, and sort of like play the margins. And they weren't playing the margins. And so now the game has changed to where like cyber insurance is as important as ever before. But actually getting it is becoming the standard is going way higher now because of because of all of this. Are the are, there's so much meat on this bone right now. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. So um, first things first, I see a lot of business leaders still not fearing outcomes like this. And I don't know where you see that. Of course, when you get a call, they are probably fearing the outcome. But are you are you do you have any visibility that I'm seeing, for example, where like I buy in, you use the term buy in. That's a mm -hmm. key. That's a key term that just says, like, do you believe in what we're saying? Do you believe what is the reality around us? Do you have any visibility in that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's natural for a small and mid-sized business to not have the buy-in initially, right? Um, if, if they don't know anyone that's been hit by something, if right. they've not been hit by something themselves, or they don't have a supplier above them forcing it, it's natural for that, right? It's exactly. that whole, like, I'm not a target. No one's coming after me. I've yep. never been a threat before. Why, why is anyone coming after me now? It's natural to have those. Um, and I've spent the past few years of my career helping like explain just how Educate. much of a target you are because education is key here. That's right. right. It's not about scaring. It's not about the boy who cried wolf. It's about helping them understand things like, and I'll walk them through, Hey, as a small business, did you know the average ransomware outage time is 16 days? 
So what would happen to your just just the outage time? What would right. happen if we took half your month's revenue and slashed it in half? And they're like, I hadn't thought about that. Right. So like just giving them tools to educate is crazy important. And then right. let's I'll just make a number up. Right. Let's say cyber insurance costs your organization five thousand a year. Right. It all depends on the industry and size and revenue. Revenues, right. right yeah. But when they understand that and they're like, wait a second. So for a very low cost, I can off if I do the right things. You know, I have the right things in place, like security awareness training and all these other things. I was going to get to that next. We're going to get to the criteria. Okay. And, and yeah. So things. then the business owner gets, says, I'm risk transferring a significant amount of way just by doing the right things at a very low cost. Now this makes sense to me. But they just have okay. to understand the outcome of the damages. So now tie that into, OK, <laughs> business owner buy in, went to a seminar or, you know, maybe their uh, uh, industry association is making them or now you just business liability is hard to get without in some cybersecurity. I'm covered. So now I don't have to respond to Eric's emails as much. This whole security <laughs> awareness training platform that he's trying to get, you know, get us tuned up to. I don't know what that is. That's another money grab that Eric's trying to send to us, whatever. What is the what are what are the hoops? Let's call them hoops that they that the insurer has uh, expects the the person to jump through the the organization to jump through. What are you what are you seeing there? So there are five. If you if you look at all of the carriers together, so one of the things we have the advantage of doing is we're not a carrier, right? I'm not the one giving you insurance. I'm matching you up, right? So we have access to all the carriers. We know them by name. We talk to them every day. We've boiled all of it down. There are five big things that they expect. And when I say expect, they demand. If you don't have one of these five things in place and a breach occurs, the days have now come that insurance is probably going to deny the claim. Right. And wow. so this is I, I feel like I need to take notes here. So, yeah, I, this, this is going to be a, my next lead magnet on, on one of my yeah. next marketing campaigns. Well, okay, for sure. And I'll even send you all the info that you, you need out of this, too. Um, and you're see, uh, let me let me tease a little bit. You're seeing this right now. So travelers, there is a lawsuit right now with travelers in place where they are suing their insured. So their client, because in the aftermath of the breach, they discovered that multi-factor authentication, and for those of you who don't know what that is, where you get a code that comes in on an app or like a text message, whatever. The yep. client said, we have multi-factor in place. I think the I read that article. I think shows, I read that article. Did you? Yeah. So the aftermath shows they did not have it in place. Now, I don't know the outcome of the lawsuit, but this is the very first time and won't be the last that we're seeing insurance say, hey, look, we're here to, to cover, but you must do what you said that you're doing. Otherwise, uh, bad things are going to happen for you. Right. So, oh, so yeah. Okay. So, so the five things, so the five things, what are they? Number one, just that multi-factor everywhere. They want it on every, not just the it people, all users. They wow. Want so that's a, everywhere. that's a technically specific thing. Yep. All right. Keep going. Multi-factor yep. on everything. We're we, we say you should, you know, the, our standing recommendation to our clients is multi-factor where available. Okay. Right? Yeah. Well, Okay, that's a great point. Because, you can because have, unfortunately, you... the multi-factor is administered and provided by every vendor and tool set, uh, kind of independently. And you would be you would be amazed at how differently they you know every single vendor can approach multi-factor. Yep, for sure, totally agree with that. And that's where you that Eric, that's where you guys are a critical component for the client because they don't know a lot of those things. And it's okay right. for you to carve out and say, hey. Here is one area that multi-factor cannot be done. If you carve those things out, you're good to go. Okay. The, but the, you have to disclose them for sure. So multi-factor everywhere, carve out what can't be done. That's number one. Uh, number two is segregated backups. So they want to see that you have backups going out to cloud, that they're what we call immutable to where they can't be edited and changed because we've seen time and time again, a bad guy breaks into the network. What do they do? They find your local backups, psh, they wipe them, they and them. now you're up a creek without a paddle. So that's number two. So let me just add commentary to everything, and I apologize. No, right? I want you to. You got an hour to fill. I still have clients who are afraid of the cloud and think that they're not using the cloud, and say, "Well, buy your local backup product, but we don't want we don't want this cloud. We don't want our data in the cloud." Of course, we could you know blue in the face to help telling them you're talking to me on a VoIP phone service. I emailed you for this meeting, like you're on the cloud. You know what I mean? Your yep. email lives with Microsoft. Um, so to your point, number two, immutable backups, um, is a cloud backup a requisite specifically, or is it just the term immutable? You're going, uh, immutable and segregated. Those are the two big words. So if it's not in the cloud, you're going to really have to defend to insurance, how it's not accessible to a threat actor if Very it's in the same network. And that's okay. going to be difficult. 
I appreciate I mean, you letting me kind of boil this all down because I think it's important. Yep. And and I will tell you this too. I, I would disclose I'd be in a very fearful position if I'm sitting there as the business owner and I'm, a, and I don't want to use cloud for backups. Uh, and you're going to have to disclose to insurance exactly why and how you can defend that it, it actually was segregated. Because again, if they find that your backups have been deleted and were very poorly implemented, um, you may have a rough time on the claim wow. process. This is really good stuff, Wes. What, All right, uh, number. Th what do you got for number three? I'm sorry, Connor. You want you want co comment? I was gonna say what uh what the business owner didn't want to do it is that a is that a valid excuse that an insurance carrier is gonna take? <laughs> I'm the, afraid not. The <laughs> business owner still starts his car by standing in front of it with a crank like this, <laughs> and, and then he pulls it off and throws it in the trunk when he gets know, in. Like, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that was an ageism no. comment. That was inappropriate. I take it back. We'll edit no. that out in post. <laughs> All right. So number three uh, is EDR. So this stands for endpoint detection and response. And we are now at the era where EDR is expected. So think of this and Eric, you can, you can add into this. Um, this is where we're going beyond just classic antivirus. And we're really looking at what's the behavior of the endpoint, because as we know, if it's a phishing attack and something malware is introduced from that, um, or it's a website they visit, whatever. This is one of the first ways that we see these things happen. We can sort of cut the head off a snake before something happens. This is really fascinating to me. So number, this is number four. We're on number four. This is EDR. number three. Number oh, this is number three. EDR. Yep. Okay. So yes, we still sell classic antivirus to yep. the clients who will not buy the EDR. Okay. A um, couple dollars a month uh, extra per per endpoint, whatever. We try to tell them about this behavior analysis. Honestly, until this very moment, I had no idea that the level of sophistication with the insurance company was at the point where you guys were discerning between antivirus and behavioral analysis uh, monitoring, endpoint so, monitoring. To your point, here's what just happened last week. I had a client that was trying to go through their insurance, you know, all their cyber stuff, and they did not have EDR in place. And so we went out and said, okay, understand. We're going to go shop. We're going to go find the right carrier for you. We have access to all of them. We found one that was willing to, um, to uh, bind with them. Five, but, five X premium. Well, here's what happened. Yeah. The, the client wanted a million dollars in total aggregate coverage. The carrier came back and said, we'll do that. But if it's ransomware, if you have, if you don't have EDR in place and you're hit by ransomware, we'll only cover up to 250 K. Wow. So that's what they did. They said, we're going to bring down, we're going to bring an exclusion in and we're going to limit the damages for us because the insurance is, they're the ones that are saying, we see where EDR plays as a role of stopping ransomware dead in its tracks because it stops it before it happens. That's why they said, fine, but you're, yeah, you got a huge, exclusion. well, it stops it in play, so to speak. Yes. Right. I mean, the behavior is happening. You you clicked on the back. OK, fine. You, the, the training failed. The antivirus failed. You clicked on the link. The EDR is intending to identify what is going to happen after that click, that cl the link click and, and stops the behavior of the bad actor. Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm like floored at the level of sophistication, but I'm also encouraged to, to I always like to see when when I don't like, you know, blanket policy, so to speak. So it's interesting to see that an insurance company is sophisticated enough to identify these technologies. It's really cool. I mean, it, it's really fascinating that the insurance carrier understands the, the difference between antivirus and behavior uh, endpoint. All right. So number four, what do you number got for number four? four? Is, uh, five is the best, but number four is an interesting one uh, because it goes to Eric, to what you just said. And, and I, so they want to see next generation antivirus, which oh, okay. is like, uh, so m most of you, Eric, I know, you it's know, redundant. What that is. Connor, you do. Yeah, it, it is redundant. Right. But what they're looking for, like, I'll give you examples of next gen antivirus, like Sophos intercept X Sentinel one crowd strike. A lot of these that are like doing, they have algorithms that are looking for anomalous stuff. That's like, Hey, I'm not saying hundred percent sure this is bad, but sure looks weird. And what's weird is zero Eric, trust, right? Yeah. And, and what's weird is this whole like EDR and next gen and antivirus are kind of becoming one big thing. They're all they're they're kind of coming together. So I think if you give us another year or two, you'll see them say next generation antivirus slash EDR and just one big with EDR kind of yeah. category. Yeah. Do they do they specifically mention more than just signature based? Uh, yes, they do. Antivirus? Okay. Yep. So they're yeah, that's they're, obvious that they're saying they're moving away from that for sure. Yep. Yep. All right. The big reveal. What's number five? Number five, security awareness training. Security awareness training. And they want to see it for all your folks. They don't want it just on like your line folks. They want it on C suite on down. And they, they, that, they want to see it. That's incredible. I mean, we're we we want we 
we drank the Kool-Aid um, at the beginning of this year. We went all in. I mean, chips on the table, right? Love Connor it. was there kind of at the beginning for us. Um, I'm not surprised in the least. I mean, st- the Susie email that you guys just saw is why. Um, the other power, and I don't want to speak for you, Connor, because it's your industry. So chime in. Take the mic at any time you want. <laughs> sure. But I, I'm just so enthusiastic <laughs> about this because it's such an exciting and interesting time. Um I, honestly, I'm excited because I, I feel like finally the every man and woman uh, has the best opportunity they've ever had to partner with us, the IT consultant and sub vendor to understand finally what we're saying, because we have resources like the insurance companies now saying this. Um, I will add that I'm surprised that your list, uh, um, the insurance providers don't have one more. One more thing. In fact, I think they can consolidate those two antivirus things and add um, this piece. And this is the self-serving piece. Um, we're a, a your dentist should not be his IT guy. Your let me say that again. Your dentist should not be managing his own IT. That is irresponsible. That 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 is irresponsible um, and negligent because you need a trained resource that can understand the implications of all of these systems of under managing them, not turning MFA on, not having a behavioral now, uh, uh, antivirus or next gen antivirus by only, uh, implementing the cybersecurity training platform, uh, but ignoring the fact that the leadership, um, thinks that their collars too white to participate in such an employee type type platform. Um, you know, so you, in my opinion, you're, the insurers are missing this piece that says, no, you need to have a qualified resource it leading and advising the business for these things. Totally self-serving on my part, but let's face it, you can hire it in-house or you can shop one of, you could go with one of our competitors, but you need, you need, you know, it's like, well, I mean, the legal realm is probably a bad example because everybody can rep- has the right to represent themselves in the court of law. But everybody knows that do you want to, is it, is it in your best interest to represent yourself in the court of law? No. Should your dentist be his IT guy? Should your lawyer be managing his IT systems where your financial affidavits and your evidence and where all of your documents and information are, should your lawyer be managing his IT? So me, uh, founder of Autotask, Reg Harnish, and then Jimmy Hatzel, uh, I asked him what his new title was and I already forget it. So if he sees this, sorry, Jimmy, um, just talked about this is, does it have to be a third party that does cybersecurity, like a third party partner, like what Reg is doing right now, Orbital Fire, or can it be the actual MSP that does the security services as well? And then the common ground we landed at was as long as a cybersecurity professional is doing the cybersecurity work, it doesn't matter if it's internal or external, there's obviously benefits and drawbacks to both. But as a business owner, you get to decide right. which, which benefits and which drawbacks. And therein is the problem, Connor, right? Because, I mean, I hired cybersecurity analysts left and right at Perch, and I was paying between 80 and 120 k for a qualified cybersecurity yeah. person, just not including benefits. And so yeah. small business just can't do that, can't right? Do and that. so this goes back to Eric's point of like, I can do that. That's why I'm here, because that's what I specialize in. That's that's where we fit in. I mean, accounting. Do, do you do you do your own taxes or do you hire a CPA once a year? I mean, that's what the business that's the business uh, imperative. You know, it's all about resource management and and having. You know, it's 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 incumbent on the business leadership to have the 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 enough knowledge, base knowledge, to know what resources you need to succeed. You know, to su- succeed in the business. Um, else, you will fail else you will you will you know personally or professionally fail so i i am emphatical i i try really hard every time connor right to just kind of like calm down i'm o- always over caffeinated but i end up get really really excited about these these things yeah um i love what i do and i love who i do it for so um that's where i come from on this stuff um we are at the 50 minute mark i always like to keep these things under an hour um what did we miss uh, two, two, why well, we definitely won't have time to talk about these, but two things that I've been chatting about with Wes a bunch. One is sub limits. I just found out about that from watching your other video, uh, Wes. So it's like in the event something happens, the amount that gets paid out is dependent upon how the attack occurred and how it transpired, which blows my mind. 
Uh, and then there was a, a second thing that I was talking about with you and I totally forget what it is by now, but that supplement conversation was insane. Yeah. And, and here's that can get technical. So let me make it not technical for a minute. Um, one thing you want to do is no matter what, don't just sign an insurance policy and move on. You've really got to understand what's in it, what's not in it. There's a there's a um, another suit that just came out once again, travelers <laughs> of all people. Um, but travelers just won a lawsuit against one of their insureds that sued them uh, because there wasn't um, it, there was limit. There was a business email compromise that happened for the client. The damages uh, were about six hundred thousand dollars wired out. And um, the it, travelers is only going to pay a certain amount coming back to that sublimit that you just mentioned, Connor. And the insured, the client was like, wait a second, we have we have a million dollars. Losses were 600. Why are you not paying for all of this? And it went to it went to court and they ruled in travelers favor because there was a sublimit of basically social engineering damages that came was not computer fraud damages to the computer itself. It came against the human and the human wiring stuff out. And so the outcome of that was the client was totally unprepared and had hundreds of thousands of dollars of, uh, of exposed loss. So what's the moral of that story? The moral of the story <clears throat> is you got to talk and understand what your limits are, what your sublimits are. You got to talk. And if your agent that you're talking to doesn't know those things, you got to find somebody qualified because these things do happen. Oh, yeah. Good and guys there. It's always the, the last 10 or 20 minutes um, always go the fastest because I feel like we're really hitting a stride. Um, I, I know I know why Joe Rogan now has a three and a half hour po podcast because you can really sink your teeth on it and then chop it up for shorts. But we we got to get this done in an hour. Um, I really, really want to thank thank you both um, uh, per personally and professionally and bottom of my heart for for joining me on this little project. Um, Wes, um, this is the first time we've interacted. I hope that you'll come on uh, Evernet Reviews and um, and re let us review Fifth Wall with, for you um, so we give you that coverage. Love it. Um, I think we can spend an hour just talking about your company and, and making sure everybody's aware of what that is and, and what value you can bring there. Um, and I hope you guys come back again. So I'll, I'll, I send an email uh, every month or so to uh, my vendor uh, uh, contacts and say, hey, if you haven't been a on recently to show us what's new or talk about you, your product um you know i welcome you back it's uh good good air time for everybody so uh and connor you're you're now you might be my uh i don't know ben ben spencer uh has been on a number of times too but yeah. you guys are neck and neck in um, i think this is three I think three this is number three for me good um so let me just put a little more so this is evernet round table um so I'm going to bring us out. Let's see, what should I do here? Live production, right? So um, yeah, again, I want to, I thank uh, Wes Spencer of Fifth Wall Solutions. You can find him at, let's see, we've got a banner here, fifth, fifthwallsolutions.com. And we have Connor Swam of Fin Security, and he is finsec.io. Uh, I am Eric Bjorndorf, the CEO of Evernet Consulting, America's best IT service provider. If you have any questions about anything you, you, talk, uh, you saw today, email me at, um, well, just go to evernetco, evernetco.com. I don't, I don't even have my own banner up here, but you get the idea. All right, guys, have a great week. Um, thank you again.